love is not a prison. A thousand amens. Amen. Uh, stand with me if you would, if you feel free to uh, be more comfortable, relax. But we're talking about recognition, about seeing God. How many of you do you think you would have recognized Jesus if you were here in the first century? How many of you would have actually recognized him? Or would you have been too busy? Would you have been too worried, too hassled about the bills? Would you have seen him? But it's so important for us to see this. Uh, here's the, the beautiful card. If you haven't assigned it yet, we're going to be handing it to Leon. They actually have a handful of 100 birthday cards there for celebrating 100th birthday. John chapter 1, verse 10, and then we're going to slip over to um, John chapter 1, verse 29. You know the context here? We've been looking. John chapter 1 is such a glorious chapter. The revelation of Jesus is so strong here. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. John the Baptist, his cousin, we know that Jesus and John were cousins. It's just connecting the dots of uh, the book of Luke. John the Baptist knew Jesus in the flesh, if you will. He knew him as his, his cousin, but he did not recognize him until the Spirit spoke to him. Uh, verse 29 of John chapter 1. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me. That is Jesus. Because he was before me. The eternality before Abraham was I am, says in John's gospel. I myself did not know him. Now we know he knew him as his cousin, but he didn't understand who he was. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit, come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, he says the second time. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize, Yahweh Elohim Sabaoth, with water told me, the man on whom you see the Ruach, the Spirit, come down and remain is he who will baptize with Ruach HaKodesh, this, the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Lord, we open the Scripture here. We ask you, Lord, for clarity of vision Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We want to see Jesus. I pray, Lord, that out of your blessed grace, that you will enlighten our hearts so that we can know the hope to which we are called. To overcome darkness in us and through us, through the churches on the North Shore. Lord, we bind our hearts together and thank you, God, for healing, grace, and deliverance in the name of Jesus. Everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm holding in my hand uh, something that has really humbled Dory and myself. This is our passport photos. I'm not going to pass them out because Dory and I look like escaped convicts. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not planning on going anywhere this year, uh, but we just, our passports ran out, and we know that you've got to be ready to go somewhere. If God calls you to go somewhere, whether it's Israel or Ireland, so we went and got our passport photos made over at CVS, and believe me, we look like escaped convicts. It's, I don't recognize myself from who I used to be. I have this image in my mind of who I am, and then I go and look in the mirror, and it blows my dream to smithereens. Dear Jesus... <laughs> Do you mind if I pass this around? Dory won't let me pass it around, so uh, I, I offered. But I don't recognize myself from who I think I am, from who I want to be. And then I go and look in the mirror. I, I think I'm going to get a picture of me when I was in my mid-20s, put it on the mirror. And every time I walk in front of the mirror, just push the button and say, ah, there I am. I recognize you. Where have you been? <laughs> 
But it's so important for us to uh, have the gift of true recognition. This is who I really am. God wants me to wake up and smell my age. You know, I really am 65, and I better act that way and realize that God is with me more now than he... How many of you have heard the phrase, youth is wasted on the young? I, I knew nothing when I was in my 20s, and I would be frivolous, and I would... But God has smitten me with some grace and some wisdom and some compassion in my life so that I'm not so quick to... Ju- How many of you realize that sometimes when a person gets set free from cigarette smoking, they're the first person to judge and condemn those who have not yet been set free? You have to have a little wisdom. You see, you get set free from someone. Does that give you the right to condemn anyone? That gives you the right to be compassionate towards someone and patient and prayerful because you know what a knucklehead you were all those years. C.S. Lewis says, I read to know that I'm not alone. That is, he would read books to find out that there's somebody else who's like he is. Somebody else who is going through the same kind of thing that he is. I love the story, true story of, I'm reading Leonard Cohen's uh, uh, biography written about him. And Leonard Cohen, when he was 49 years old, had a group of 10 songs. His career with Columbia Records was kind of uh, shaking a little bit. And the, the president of Columbia Records calls him in and says, Leonard, we know that you are great, but we're not so sure you're any good anymore. 49 years old, and there was Leonard wearing a three-piece black suit and a white shirt, and they just didn't think that he fit the image anymore. We, say, we feel that your songs are hopelessly out of date and belong to another generation. And there was a song on that album called Alleluia that was going to finally be released through other means, find its way into a movie called Shrek, and has now been covered by over 300 people. Incredible. And it's an amazing song. It's a modern-day psalm that is painful to listen to. And he has 24 verses to it. Most of three or four have been released. Because it's a modern-day psalm. My God, my God, I feel like you've forsaken me. And he's not afraid to just express his emotion. But the album passed on, was released in Europe, and it sold so well in Europe, finally they ended up releasing it three years later in the United States, and it became his best-selling album. The president of Columbia Records did not recognize the greatness of what was in that. He was getting older and older, and more wisdom was coming forth from him. He was able to relate to people instead of be judgmental towards them. But we all have this problem of lack of being able to recognize things. One of my favorite books of all time is The Confession of St. Patrick. And a wonderful Catholic priest by the name of John O'Donohue writes about what he feels is one of the most important aspects of St. Patrick's life, that he was given the gift of recognition, divine recognition. He was able to see things that others didn't see. And uh, he writes, and and I quote, The structure of this initial moment in Patrick's life sets the rhythm of Patrick's subsequent life, namely the practice of a spirituality of transfiguration. And if you know the story of Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration, here's the lowly, humble carpenter, unrecognized by most. He goes up on the mountain of glory on Mount Hermon, and what happens there with Peter, James, and John? Suddenly, he's, he's the glorious Lord of eternity. He's the glorious Lord who, in this pre-incarnational state, is revealed as the glorious Lord already risen from the dead, even though he has not yet died and risen. It's that spirituality of transfiguration. That is, he can see things before they are as they really are. And he goes on, John O'Donohue, about St. Patrick. His physical slavery releases him into a life of inner liberation. He's free. His captors only controlled his tasks and his location, but they never could get near to the eternal spring that was awakening in his heart and in his mind. Patrick understands his slavery as the doorway into divine recognition. 
and friendship with the Lord. That is, when St. Patrick was stolen, he was abducted, and he was made a slave in Ireland, he began to translate that in a different way, not as a tragedy to be filled with bitterness and anger and anger at God, but he began to reinterpret it in a transfigurative way, that this is really God's opportunity to get a hold of my life, because I was going nowhere. I was wasting my life. My father was a deacon in the church, and I didn't give glory to God for that. I was missing the mark, totally missing it. We have a problem of recognition regarding Jesus. We see it in the scriptures here. He was in the world, though the world was made through him, John chapter 1, verse 10. But the world did not recognize him. So the, the Greek word ginosko, it means to know him. A little bit later here in the chapter, uh, John the disciple, uh, the baptizer, John the son of Zechariah, I myself did not recognize him. What is he saying there? Okay, his cousin Jesus, I know his mother, uh, I know the, my, our parents have this unique bond and they, they love to talk about the childhood births and all of these things, but suddenly John the Baptist has an ability from heaven to recognize something that he never saw before in his cousin Jesus, that he is the Lamb of God and the Son of God, the Word of God made flesh. All of a sudden he starts downloading to him this incoming a revelation. It's beautiful. But look at what it is, this real problem. Jesus comes incognito, if you will, in disguise. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 27. This is a problem that is throughout the scripture, brothers and sisters. You don't want to miss it. Here's a, a message that is being given, is it being spoken. Brothers, children of Abraham. This is Acts 13, 26. You God-fearing Gentiles, it is us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Shabbat, every Sabbath. They did not recognize Jesus when he was in their midst. But the very scriptures that they would read every Sabbath were proclaiming him, but they didn't recognize it, brothers and sisters, tragedy. Paul the Apostle, I believe, saw Jesus with his own two eyes when he was, uh, when he, as Jesus was doing his ministry. And Paul had to make sure that he, he didn't fall into the pit of this lack of recognition problem. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.16, so from now on, we will regard no one from a worldly point of view. The word for worldly there is actually sarks, is where we get the word sarcasm. We, uh, we will uh, regard no one from a sarks, a sarcastic point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. That is, Paul said, I missed it. I totally missed it until I was walking on the road to Damascus and a lightning from heaven came down and it was Jesus talking to me. Suddenly, I recognized who he really was. But we regard no one any longer from a Sark's point of view. How many of you realize that sometimes you can entertain angels unaware? I have my suspicions about some of you. Some of you are on my checklist for being possible angels, well-disguised angels. Some of you very well could be hidden angels. Paul Pastorella, you think Paul Pastorella is a normal, average person? I believe his car is what is the tip-off. What angel would drive around Paul's car? But Paul's car never dies. It has eternal fuel in it. It just never dies Paul Pastorello gets stronger and stronger. He's approaching 80 years old. I believe Paul Pastorello is actually an angel in disguise, and most of us have just missed it. We should regard no one according to a worldly point of view anymore. You don't know who they might be. You don't know how God is going to use them. 
It may shock you. It may shock me. God does things incognito, and it's an amazing thing. This is a problem. This problem of recognition is in Scripture. Look at Genesis 42.8. This is one of my favorite. I love the story of Joseph, as I know you do also. When his brothers came in their desperate situation, they were so twisted up. They were so worried. They were so fee- uh, f- uh, fearful. And the Scripture very carefully tells us in Genesis chapter 42, verse 8, although Joseph recognized his brothers, his brothers did not recognize him. Now, why, why would that be? Well, well, first of all, Joseph was much younger. You know, if, if I brought you my pictures of when I'm in my teens as compared to when I am now, you might not recognize me. You might say, oh, goodness, I didn't know you were so uh, handsome when you were young. Or but you sure don't look that way now. But, but it is a similar with Joseph. You know, Joseph was in his teens when they sold him as a slave. And now he's in his 30s or his 40s. You know, do the math if you want to. But he doesn't look like him. But I believe there was other things going on in the brothers' lives. They were so stressed out. They were so worried. They were uh, starving partially to death. Their father, they had to lead home. And they were so preoccupied with their stuff and their things that they failed to recognize their own flesh and blood. I think we should be able to recognize someone that we haven't seen for a while by looking into their face, taking the time to look into their eyes and say, there you are. There you are. I haven't looked in your face for a long time, but there you are. God looks right into us. He recognizes us all the time, and God wants to help us to recognize, to see things that are true. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 through 12. This is a very unique situation that repeats itself over and over in Scripture. And the word recognition is nicely used by the NIV, Matthew 17. Here's the chapter on transfiguration where we see Jesus is transfigured before Peter, James, and John. He's not the humble carpenter from Nazareth, but he is the Lord of glory in this glory state, and it's unveiled to the disciples. But then Jesus talks about this problem of lack of recognition. Look what he says in 1711 of Matthew. To be sure, Elijah comes, that is John the Baptist, son of Zechariah, and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him. John the Baptist came and, ah, just another off-the-wall prophet. Just another uh, prophet from Israel who thinks he's Elijah. I was, this last week, I had a crisis situation in going to the dentist. Uh, How many of you have ever had a bad trip going to the dentist? I have had some nasty experience. I'll spare you the details. So when I go to the dentist, for me, it's dive into dependency on the Lord. I want to get this over, but the Lord teaches me that life is about moment by moment by moment dependency upon Jesus. I like to think, oh, where will I, what will I be doing next week at this time? And next week at this time, I'll be in California visiting Nicholas. I don't have to worry about the, what I have to do in the next two hours because in one week's time, it's California. And then the Lord says, no, no, California will come in time. Right now, it's moment by moment, second by second, dependency upon me. Don't fast forward. Don't take your little click fast forward machine. How many of you saw the movie Click, Adam Sandler? A great prophetic movie. But most of us want to fast forward our way through the painful situations. Oh, I've got a cold coming on. Oh, no, I feel terrible. Let me fast forward through this because I don't want to have to deal with it. No, your portion is moment by moment, second by second dependency upon me. Baby steps for you, Scott. Baby steps until you get this down. One step at a time and I will be with you. One step at a time. But recognition, we have to be able to recognize. So there I go to the the dentist, and God is really speaking to me in the dentist chair. I'm getting flashbacks of when I was a child. 
I start to get flashbacks of all the awesome things that happened at Brookfield Assembly of God. I get out of the dentist's office, and the Spirit of God hits me as I'm driving down the street, and I just start thanking God for Mario Murillo, who came to Brookfield Assembly of God when the atmosphere was electric, and they would, he would come on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and Monday night, and there would be powerful times of revival at Brookfield Assembly of God. It was more exciting than the Super Bowl, I promise you. Or when Alton Garrison would come and speak for an entire week at Brookfield Assembly of God. I started remembering all these incredible moments when God's servants came to Brookfield Assembly of God. I remembered, oh, wow, what awesome things God was. And I was recognizing what God had done in the past. And then remembering, oh, that's right. That's why we're in ministry. What Dory and I experienced at Brookfield Assembly of God, we wanted to bring out here to Church of the Redeemer and Christian Renewal Church. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's why I'm in ministry. I remember now. I recognize that. And it was really a cool moment. It was all because I'm panicking going into the dentist. Leonard Cohen has this great line in his song, Suzanne, that he's grown very tired of singing. Leonard Cohen died, of course, and he says, but when Jesus knew for certain that only drowning men could see him, recognize him. Now, I know it doesn't have to be that way, but oftentimes, how many of you know, brothers and sisters, you dive into the pool of dependency upon the Lord because a surgery is pending next week or because you had a, a situation that's pressing your life or you had a situation with your dentures, two denture ladies side by side. God bless you. I'll give you a dollar for using you as sermon illustrations. There's our two denture ladies who recently have gone through crises with their dentures. God bless you. Forgive me. Dory will edit it from the machine. Don't worry. But we have to recognize these things. Brothers and sisters, God will reveal himself to us in difficult circumstances. Uh, it's so important for us to see this. Look at this, Luke 19.44. Man's extremities are God's opportunities. Monday, um, February is get out of debt month. God's going to do it. God's going to do it using us. There's a beautiful uh, passage here. This is a prophetic word that Jesus gives concerning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Dora and I saw the wall and prayed there, the remnants of the temple wall. Uh, but it says in the middle of verse 44, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Pretty heavy word. There's a real strong underlining in Scripture that we must learn to recognize the time of God's coming to us. God is very gracious, and it'll come full circle again frequently, but God wants us to get on the carousel when it's coming our way. God wants us to get on the Ferris wheel when it's going around in circles because there are unique moments of entry. And the, there was a time to get on Noah's Ark, and then there was a time when it was too late. God has unique moments for us all. But biblical pointers to receive the grace of divine recognition. We need some daily pointers. Uh, look at Luke chapter 24. This is one of my favorite passages. The problem of recognizing Jesus went on after the, rec the resurrection. Look at Luke chapter 24, verse 31. Their eyes were open, and they recognized him. Was in Jesus' resurrected state on the road to uh, Emmaus, they did not recognize Jesus, didn't see him. Again, they were steeped in sorrow, the feeling that Jesus um, had didn't understand the death and the resurrection, didn't understand Isaiah 53. Jesus was beginning to open their eyes. Eyes, But then it says, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Very important little passage. And fast forward to verse 35 again. They said, then the two told what had happened to them on the road to Emmaus, and how Jesus was recognized by them. 
they recognized him when he broke the bread. Brothers and sisters, one thing we should do continuously, look at Psalm 119, verse 18. Psalm 119, verse 18. One of the things that I have to do as someone who's in the ministry, I have many people knock on my door, call me up and say, I need money, I need cash, I need it right away, my rent is due tomorrow, and I have to have the grace from heaven to recognize what's going on. We have to all have this daily grace of recognition because I don't want to miss the opportunity to bless someone, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to... If Jesus comes to me in the form of someone who's poor and who's lonely and who's broken, I don't want to miss that. So we pray daily. Look at uh, Psalm 119, verse 18. You you must do this daily. I must do this daily. Uh, Verse 18, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Pray daily, brothers and sisters, when you get up. Before you stand up, get on your knees and say, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be stuck in the routines of life, the sorrows, the aches, the bills that have to be paid, this problem, that problem. Donald Trump, God bless Donald Trump. We pray for him daily. But Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, to see. Open my eyes. I want to behold Jesus. The wonderful song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Paul says in Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart, uh, Paul Belosh wrote the song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, inspired from this verse. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know the hope to which you have been called. We need the eyes of our hearts to be open to see that, to receive it daily in the midst of life's discouragements and trials and satanic plots against us and our families. But also, not only do we need to pray daily to open our eyes uh, to see things in the Word and see things in the world, but also, number two, that we confess our blindness and our deafness. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 13, Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. Matthew 13, 13. That is, we must confess our blindness daily. I'm blind. How many of you recognize you are blind sometimes? You don't see. You see, but you don't see. You hear, but you don't understand. We have to confess our blindness and our deafness On a daily basis, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I'm blind. Help me to see. Help me not to miss it. I get, uh, I'm learning through your beloved son, Brian. I'm learning to pick up the phone and say, Brian, how are you? He called me this morning. I just say, Brian, how you doing? And God is teaching me. Phyllis, he could be the next John the Baptist for all we know. I had him reading Psalm uh, Psalm 40, verse 1 through 3 in the car on Friday. And I said, Brian, have you ever read Scripture out loud in in your history of growing up as a pastor's son? He said, no, no, I don't don't believe I ever did. I said, how would you like to do a call to worship just like you did now? Read Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, because there is no pit so deep that Jesus is not deeper still. In Psalm 40, uh, 1 through 3, I says, "Uh, Brian, this is where you are, I believe, right now. In your life. And he says, yeah, you think so? And he read, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and out of the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He says, that's my life. He probably, I said, would you like to do a call to worship for us some Sunday? He said, yes. So let's all pray for Brian. You have no idea Brian McVitie could be the next Billy Graham in his elder years. And that would shock Phyllis. But how do you know? All things are possible with God. Nothing is too hard for him. For our sons, for my daughter in Milwaukee, cover them daily. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing. Those seeing, they do not see. Those hearing, they do not understand. There's a lot of people that God can turn around that we rub shoulders with daily. 
And we, we read it earlier, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.16, regard no one from a worldly point of view. No one. C.S. Lewis says in his, his awesome book, The Weight of Glory, you have never met a mere mortal. Every human being is infused with divine glory, whether we recognize and acknowledge it or not. Yes, it's in a fallen state for so many. But God, that's why we, we are pro-life. That's why we don't believe in abortion. The minute a, a baby is conceived in the womb, that baby is in the, created in the image of God and has divine light in it. And to kill the, womb, the baby in the womb is to destroy and murder a human being. Regard no one from a worldly point of view any longer. No longer can I regard Michael Helen. I, I, Michael Helen might be an angel also. I'm sorry for blowing your cover, bro. Michael could be an angel. He just may be an angel. I'm not sure. Regard no one from a worldly point of view any longer. You're in the grocery store. You're checking out, and you see the person's name on them. You say, God bless you, and, and call them by name. Bless them. Look them in the eye and say, ah, you're there. You're really there, aren't you? Take the time to recognize people. Daily recognize them. They're infused with divine glory. Regard no one from a worldly point of view. Recognize their value, the value of a human being. Jesus loves us all so desperately much. Number four, the last point. Daily recognize your significance with Jesus' love and forgiveness. Daily. Recognize that you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loves you. Recognize that. Take the time. You look in the mirror and say, I'm 65. I've lost my youth. I've lost so many things. But thank God I'm still standing. Thank God God is with me and he's seen me through all of the trials of my life. That's why Leon Gilman is, is a prophetic word. A hundred years, dear Lord. What a miraculous thing. He's a Jewish man like Abraham. We think of uh, his 100 years. We should flash back to Abraham and say God's faithfulness to Father Abraham. God's faithfulness. Our father, Abraham. God was faithful to Abraham, and it was in his 100th year that he and his wife Sarah gave birth to Isaac, which means laughter. God fulfills all of his promises. They are yes and amen. In Jesus Christ. And we must learn, I must learn to daily recognize my own significance with Jesus' eternal love and forgiveness. For we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Another point, this one I uh, threw in just a little while ago. Don't waste your trials, Rick Joyner says. Whether it's going to the dentist or you've got surgery or no matter what it is, recognize every situation so that you don't become bitter and angry. Recognize every situation as God's opportunity. God will redeem every situation in our lives. You must declare it. You must believe it. You must live it every day in your life. When he knew for certain that only drowning men could see him. Don't wait. Until you're drowning to call upon the name of the Lord. But believe me, when you are drowning, he is there. But don't wait. He will be there for you. Man's ex Chuck Swindoll said it a hundred times in the radio in Milwaukee. I had to hear it over and over and over again so I wouldn't forget it. Man's extremities are God's opportunities. We must learn to recognize where you are right now. In any difficulty, in any sorrow, in any tragedy, recognize it so that you don't become bitter and angry and cursing God. This is God's opportunity for you. God loves you. He will never leave you. There is no pit so deep that Jesus is not deeper still. Lord bless Rabbi Lee Levin. You had me. I was hanging out with Mitch at GameStop, and there was Rabbi Lee Levin sprinting into the movie theater at 11.30 on what day was it? Wednesday, 11.30 in the morning on Wednesday. Lord bless Rabbi Lee Levin. This congregation has uh, loved him over the years. Uh, we would walk across the street to his services. 
uh, Abba Father, and uh, he came, and there's that picture of Rabbi Lee Levin and myself arm in arm at a gathering uh, as we prayed for reconciliation in the world, racial reconciliation. The picture is downstairs on the bulletin board. But Lord, we humble our hearts before you now. Give us the grace of recognition. Help us to see you in our midst. Lord, we will bless and magnify your holy name. If you would like prayer, Dory and I are here to pray for you. Freedom for my soul. 